Hello and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. My name is Joe Everett. I'm the family and local history librarian for the BYU Library and producer of the BYU Family History Library webinar series. My production assistant, Anna Allred, has a final today, and so she could not be with us. Uh, so I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. This will be our final webinar for 2021 as we are heading into the Christmas break. Please check our website for webinars coming up in January of 2022. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Baker, who will be giving a presentation titled Bonanza, Strategies to Add a Lot of People to Your Family Tree. Mr. Baker has been an active genealogist for the past 15 years. In 2011, he completed the Board for Certification of Genealogists requirements to become a certified genealogist with a specialty in Germany genealogy research. He also specializes in Midwest US, early American research and DNA. He was an officer in the Sacramento German Genealogy Society and contributed numerous articles to its quarterly publication, Der Blumenbaum. He also wrote articles for the National Genealogical Society magazine and the NGS Quarterly. He volunteered for 10 years at the Sacramento Regional Family History Library. He has presented a total of nine webinars for Legacy Family Tree and for the so Southern California Genealogy Jamboree communities. Beginning in 2012, he has given over 400 presentations to over 50 genealogy societies at local, regional, and national genealogy events. James earned a PhD in sociology and social psychology from the University of Utah. He has retired from an aerospace and business management career. In his work career, he consulted for many large companies, including Boeing, General Electric, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon. He has been an adjunct professor of sociology at UCLA and USC. His most fun job was being the piano man at Shakey's Pizza Parlor. All right, James, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and turn the time over to you. There you go. Okay, great. All right, there's the picture of the bonanza. Look at all that good stuff. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And here is uh, today, it is a genealogy bonanza that we're talking about. Once in a while, when we're going through a variety of records, we just really hit the jackpot. We find just numerous uh, good records that you can add a lot of people to your family tree. <clears throat> now, sometimes it's, it's tough going and we dig around and we dig and we work hard and then we find just one or two people. And yes, that makes us happy, but today we're going to think big and we're going to think about situations where we can add 50 or 100 or more than that to our database and that's going to make us even happier. Now you say, where can we find a bonanza like this? Well, <clears throat> different ways, different happenings. Sometimes it is another researcher who has, they've come before us, they've figured it all out, they have published the material, and it's just all there ready to be picked. Um, Maybe it is a particular surname family that, that that other person has done business with. Maybe there are records for a particular town or a particular church or parish, and that has already been researched 
and it is just sitting there waiting for us to, to use. Or in some cases, we can develop our own bonanza. We'll talk about each of those different kinds. And I'll tell you about my own starting place. My folks were Illinois people. They both were living in Logan County, Illinois, right in the center of the state. Uh, my dad came from a large family. Uh, his aunts and uncles, his grandparents, they all had large families. And so I counted him one time and he had like 120 first cousins. My mother likewise. But in my case, when I was starting to do the genealogy, my family tree only went back about three generations. I had just a few people in it. So <clears throat> this was just a wide open opportunity to build a tree that was going to go forwards and backwards. I could really use a bonanza. And here is one that came about. Here's the story. 50 years ago, Logan County, Illinois, one of my second cousins, this is my dad's first cousin, this is a nice woman who was spearheading some of the Baker family reunions. There were a lot of Baker relatives in that area, a lot of them knew one another, they had, they had interacted a lot. There were these family reunions, I attended some of them, and they were all descendants according to the rules of my great grandfather who lived way back when. Adelma, good genealogist that she was, got help from her with her cousins, developed a booklet and developed a bonanza of a tree with about 1200 people in it who were descended from the immigrant. And these are all my first cousins, second cousins. Elma, Adelma had good information for all of these 10 children of her grandfather. And second bullet, this was a sizable task in those days before the internet and before all of the easy to find data that we have today. Now it's still not all that easy, but it was tougher for Adelma. But in my case, that meant that I had a very good start for my Baker family tree. And now as I link with people who have taken the DNA tests and their different kinds of cousins, I find many of those people in my tree. Well, sometimes things come to an end and the Baker reunions that continued successfully for 20 or 30 years, they, uh, that's what happened. Adelma herself was in an auto accident. She was killed. You need a spearheader. And without a spearheader, the reunions kind of failed, faded away and eventually they ended. And that's maybe 20 years ago. Well, in the meantime, up to the present, I have now identified all of these different Baker cousins who have taken the DNA test. And I usually try to contact them and say a few words about our joint ancestry. And it's easy to find these people on DNA because we all have matches that are shared matches with a lot of other people who are the other Baker cousins. Well, <clears throat> Whatever kind of a group you're in, if you are in a family reunion group or whatever, you can also get genealogy help from those different relatives. You might check to see if, if some of these people have developed some good surname data, or you might kind of spearhead an effort yourself. On my mother's side of the house, a kind of a similar story, but I had to work harder at this one because I did not have an Adelma. So it took more effort, but in time, because I kind of knew who some of these key people were and different ones contributed different data, I eventually built 
another kind of a bonanza-like tree. Now let's move on to a different kind of bonanza, a little bit different at least. I have a third cousin this time, Ray Keen. He's living in Kansas. And so he's connected with the Bakers through Nicholas Baker's wife. There was a sister that Catherine had, and he's a descendant of that group. So he's a Kaler, I'm a Kaler in a way. And so here he is. And in fact, uh, we had him one time come to the Baker family reunion. And he told us about what he had done. He had taken a trip to Germany. He went to the Kaler homeland and he had done a lot of research on that family on that particular branch and had written a very professional type book about it. <clears throat> Ray and his wife had gone through methodically they had taught themselves how to read that old German script. And so he had done really a giant work there. And this meant that he extended the family tree. And of course, part of it is my own family tree. So this became another good bonanza for me. And so I looked at, at Ray's book and uh, I was able to add about a thousand new people. And so here's kind of a picture of that family tree. Here is my Catherine Kaler. She's three generations back, but her ancestors are the same as those of her sister that Ray Keen had dug up. And so he had all of this information that he added about all of these different different ancestors and their children, and in some cases, grandchildren. In effect, he put together a surname book. Now there's nothing unique about these surname books. People have written those books for years. The common thread is that you, you deal with the birth, marriage, and death data for all of these family members who are descendants of a particular ancestor. In earlier days, the first floor of the Salt Lake City Family History Library was full of surname books. They've kind of modified the arrangement a little bit now, but those they still have the books, although many are now digitized. Well, a lot of people also post their surname books on the internet. Sometimes they do or don't know much about the different genealogy groups, but one way or another, you often can find these kinds of data. And I caution you that some people are not as careful as others when they put these books together. <clears throat> We're going to move into another bonanza, and this is a particular family branch and this has to do with internet postings. So this is where we're going to concentrate more of our effort now that we have the internet with all of the, the capability there. And so here we are working on the internet. Second bullet, one key to this business of the internet is you've got to, in my words, get in the club. You need to post your own family tree data so that you can help other people and they can help you. So I did this. And so this is maybe 15 years ago. And so this is about 2005 or so when we were, I think we were just kind of really getting rolling with, with good genealogy material on the internet. And so I posted my tree on the different sites. And I included all of that good Ray Keen information and the other bonanzas that I had. And so it's been a good thing to post those things because sometimes people will catch your mistakes that you make and they will let you know. And so with the Ray Keen things here, it was just the thing that helped me because 
One of my new internet correspondents also had a Kaler family connection. This really turned out to be really good. This is a nice Missouri woman who sent me an email and she said, I've seen your postings on the Kaler family. And she said, I am also related to that family. I have worked with a local German genealogist and we've done a fair amount of work. And would you be interested in this? Of course I'm interested. And so, so this is what she did, what she had. She sent me several sheaves of paper and it detailed the family trees, not only more for that Kaler family, but a couple of other interrelated families. And so these were that nice little town of Gimmelding. And I always like to say that it's got a nice ring to it. And so she had worked with a professional genealogist Heinz Crumry, and he had gone through not only the old parish records way back when, but earlier records, property records, tax records that were even earlier in time. The German records, are, they're really good record keepers. And so this new bonanza got me another thousand or more new names for my family tree. And here's an example of just looking at that one, the one Kaler group that she had taken back considerably further than Ray Keen had. And here, starting with generation number three, you see here are these people back there in generations nine, 10, 11. So, so I've, I've taken this group with the help of these other people back into the 1500s. And furthermore, this bonanza included for a lot of these families, their children, their spouses. So I got to go up the tree and down the tree. Now, I give you a kind of a modest complaint here because the Missouri woman really had given me good material. This, I mean, who, who could ask for more? This is really good cooperation. But then I say, why had not she posted her data? If she had done that, I could have just found it right there sitting on the internet. In fact, may, maybe it was just a lucky coincidence that she found my posted data. Here is the point. Have you posted your data? you've got to post it to get in the club. And that's why this might be the most important slide that we have today. As a reminder, you've got to post your data if you can help and if you want help from other people. Those German records are really good. I had mostly before then worked on American records that really kind of get troublesome back in the mid 1800s and in the 1700s, but the German records are there. They're comprehensive. They go back in all those towns and villages. Everybody kept records, all of the parishes. And so with detailed records like they have there and in other countries where they also do it much better than we did in America, we are going to have bonanzas just waiting to happen. In Germany, virtually all of those records still exist. It's just a matter of finding them, deciphering them, working with them. My people who came, my different great grandparents came from different German regions and all of them had really good records. I've mentioned two of the bonanzas in that Gimmeldingen area. And so, you get spoiled. Once I'm, I found a couple, I'm on the lookout for others. And in the meantime, I'm, I start looking at records for different towns. And so I'm doing what I can. I'm kind of picking up people one at a time, but now I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit another bonanza. Parish records are where it's at for German genealogy. And that's true of a lot of other countries also. 
the original records are good because they contain data for the maiden names. They have other related bonus information on occupations and things like that. And so sometimes you get even a special kind of a record that is called a family book. Some of those early ministers, parish people, the farers, the, the early priests in the different German, either Protestant or Catholic, and they create this data that's just ready-made for a genealogist. It is, it's, they call them a family book. And so here's one of my German towns. So here I am looking for data for this town. I've gone to the family search catalog and in the catalog, I put in the name of the town, Bromskirchen, and I push the buttons and it says, yes, we've got church books that go way back to the 1600s, 1625. And so I look to see exactly what all they have in those books. Down here where the arrow is, you see there is a familian book, a family book that covers the years 1565 into the 1800s. This is just what I want. And it is, it's handwritten because that's what they did in those days. But this lists all of this good birth, marriage, death data from all that time. And the book's creator builds it in a really user-friendly way. It's alphabetical, it's chronological by the family surname. And so it's easy to see every father, mother, and child for every family for that period of time. This was on microfilm. I ordered the microfilm and it really was valuable. Well, in, in fact, it was so valuable, I was able to have this bonanza of just chugging right through it and plugging all of these names into my database, about 3000 new names. I mean, these are good, really good bonanzas. I mean, think of just adding 3,000 names in one fell swoop. Well, it's not quite a, a fast, a, as fast as that, but it certainly speeds up the task because the data is so well organized. Now, of course, you can go to the original records and find out you know, who, who's born, who are the parents, and then you go back and find the parents and when they were young, when they were married, and who were their parents. But this was, it's so much easier to do it this way. I mean, it's 10 times easier. And so I found some other books along the way like that. And each time it's just really wonderful. There is one variety of this family book. It's called a Sippen book. And this is more a little bit larger in scope than the family book, although the concept is the same. So this time you might get data for all the churches in the town, or maybe data for two or three towns, all of them together. But the concept is the same. And it's listing all of that data. And one nice thing about it is that it is newer, so it is more likely to have a typeface format, and you don't have to struggle with reading the old script. Well, a few years ago, I went to 15 years ago or so, I went to Gottelsheim, and while I was there, I've, um, I wanted to visit this ancestral town, and so I was looking for people who might be my distant relatives, they might be Oh, like my third cousins, fourth cousins. My, my people came to America in the mid 1800s. So, well, that's 150 or more years ago, but, but still there could be some people. Well, in, in Gottel time, even better, I found a couple of genealogists who showed me that they had a town sipping book that some people had developed. 
And so they had put it on their town website. There you see a picture of it. I got a hard copy of it because it, it was easier to work with that way. But it is, this is just a, a page from it. And you see how, how it is arranged so nicely. It's alphabetical, it's chronological. And you can just check and see each surname family. And you look for each, each nuclear family. There's each person is listed with their birth and death data and references to their own marriages. I mean, this is really slick. And it included everybody who lived there for over 300 years. The book had in it data for, oh, I, I multiplied, you know, counted how many people on a page, 18,000 people. And when I go backwards and then forwards, I found that the majority of those people were relatives of mine who deserved to be in my database. And the book also contains some other interesting items. But this is just an absolute super bonanza. It is user friendly, it's easy to work with. You easily go the up the tree people and then you plug in the down the tree people. Now you can do it the hard way, but this is much easier. I'm showing you my example here of the banyan tree where you go backward in time up the tree, but then when you go way back six, seven, however many generations, and then you come back down the tree and now you have, you really have a solid tree upwards, downwards, so you've really got it. Now you say, hey, if the, the, where can I find such a book? Well, some towns and villages have them, some don't. You just kind of hope that they do. But among my different towns, I have found three or four of these different bonanzas. Here is one for the town of Gimmeldingen that I talked about before. There's a picture of the guy who put it together. And on the left, you see, he's, he's, uh, he's kind of made an industry of this. He has several different towns in that area, different little villages that he has done the same thing with. And each one of them is just really a superb bonanza to work with. Now this one, it was published in 2014. And so I had actually started my work on Gimelding and before then, now I guess all this means is you have to be alert because, you know, maybe you, maybe something is being published. You want to know about it because it can save you a lot of time and trouble. Well, this book was so good that not only with the Kaler family, but all of those other related families, again, my bonanza was like about 12,000 people. There's another book that I've got to look at coming up, a nearby town that might also help. Now, where do you find these books? Well, you might go to the Family Search catalog and find them there. Sometimes Family Search, uh, they can't find everything. And so the World Catalog, the worldcat.org, they keep track of every book that's ever published and they'll tell you which library it's in. And so you go to World Cat, go to Advanced Search. Here I am in Advanced Search. One of my towns in Germany is Webenheim. I want to see if they have a book. And so down there, I scroll down for this list of different different pieces of books and things from that, that refer to Webenheim. And it says, here is an Orts family book beginning from the year 1650. And that is another great find. Now, this book was published in 2013. So it seems like they're getting more and more popular. 
And so <clears throat> maybe with good luck, if you don't have one yet, it'll happen pretty soon. These books are usually not online. The uh, My Gottelheim book was, but it's at least in a few libraries. And now in this case, where the arrow is, it says it was in the Family History Library. And in fact, that's where I looked at it. So that was good. Now here is the Gimmeldingen book and here's the libraries. No, it's only in the libraries in Germany. Well, I got my own copy, so I, I was taken care of. This is what we've talked about so far. We've talked about some early bonanzas of building a tree that covers my first and second cousins. Then there was that early Gimmeldingen family tree, Ray Keen and his surname book. And then I began finding those family books and the Sippen books. And you add them all together and look at that. I've got over 30,000 people in my database now. And that's good. Continuing, here is another another source for a bonanza. And that is, this is a point that is, is well to be made. There's people all over the world doing genealogy, but it is presented in different ways. Not everybody who is a genealogist knows about family search. They don't know about ancestry. I would say more of them don't know than do know but yet they're interested in genealogy and maybe they have their homemade trees, but they, they have the, they've done the work, they've done the research. Sometimes they are amateurs, like the, the Baker tree was put together, the Kaler, those were kind of amateurs. But anyway, let's go a little further here and I'll tell you about what I found just, I think by good luck, Sometimes these things are the result of good luck rather than good research. But if you're in there pitching, maybe things will fall into your lap. So you, you do what you can. You post your tree. You work on the town data that you've got. You, you look for data on the big sites. And uh, you're, you're doing all those good things. And one other good avenue is to say, Let's look at Google and see if Google can find something for us. Because here is the great advantage. If somebody's posted something anywhere on the internet, Google knows about it. And so I've kind of played around with different things on Google. Like I put in Godelsheim genealogy, and the Paulus family or Gottelsheim plus the Scriba family, things like that. <clears throat> Here's the thing, third bullet. This is the point. A lot of people, I will go so far as to say the great majority of people post a lot of genealogy data somewhere on the internet, but they're not posting it on the large genealogy sites. They don't know about family search or ancestry, but they're interested in genealogy, they post their data. So here I'm playing around with this and I get a hit that says, here's something to do with the Scriba family in Gottelsheim. And I learned that there is a family society, the Scribas, this is one of my families, and they have reunions, they have newsletters, it's just like the American groups. And, but the Scriba group had a couple of very distinctive features. They've been organized for 200 years. And somewhere along the line, they began developing and maintaining a database of all of the descendants of their original person. And so, they have, I learned, a CD that they have developed. It's got all of those descendants, 13,000 names, 
And so I joined the society and their database I learned is absolutely incredible because they have maintained contact with people, scribos all over the world. This is like a microcosm of all the Germans because these people migrated all over the world, South Africa, Central America, and so on. They have reunions. Here's a picture of one of their reunions. I've not had a chance to go to one yet. I would hope maybe someday. But look at that. They've got an awful lot of records. But among them, here was the Bonanza. And it's this, this detailed data about all of those descendants of Conrad Scriba, third bullet, this data is not on any of the typical genealogy sites. They don't know about them, but they are, they are good genealogists. So this might be the best bonanza that I've ever run across. So think of Google as a bonanza finder. Maybe there are people who have posted huge quantities of data. And incidentally, just to show that this is not just a one-time thing. I have another family, another town, and it's kind of a mini bonanza. I didn't get as many, uh, many names out of it as I did with, with the one for the Scribas. I just show you that picture to show there's, there's a luck factor involved. Those people are playing a card game and you can sort of see that it looks like the guy on the left is doing the best. He has the tallest stack. But anyway, the point is sometimes you get lucky with your genealogy. Sometimes serendipity will count and help you as much or more than the planned research. Sometimes we're just kind of, it, it, we just happen to find the right data. And that's what I did with some of those people. And a few years ago, I thought, I've gone about as far as I can with some of these groups, but it turns out not so. And sometimes the progress you make are on family groups that you didn't think you were going to make progress on. And maybe it has to do more with just good luck or something else. Now, we have already talked about where it was really easy picking if somebody else did all the work and posted it and laid it all out there. But now how about creating our own? Because sometimes that's what you need to do and you can do it. Now, here are the DNA based opportunities. This giant quantity of DNA results has really helped a lot of people, certainly the adopted people. Some of the rest of us who have broken through brick walls. And for many of us, where my I've made this a three-star item, this is where we can increase the size of our family trees. And this is, remember the banyan tree, you go up the tree, you go down the tree, you're really going to increase the size the size of your tree. So here is where DNA is going to help you because it has so many posted trees. Ancestry has this great feature, the through line feature that has identified for you hundreds of matches. In my case, about, uh, I think they have, I think a total of about 800 different matches. And a lot of them are maybe like at the fifth cousin level. Well, the DNA results in some of those groups have really been a game changer for me with some of my more challenging family lines. In some of those cases, I, I had really great difficulty finding the paper trail, but with DNA, I could see the patterns of the kind of people I was matching and where the rest of those people went. And of course, this indicated, this showed where my new ancestors were 
as well. Well, as I go up the tree and find people that I did not have before, that means that also I will now have downward problems. I shouldn't say problems, I should say opportunities. I show you this tree on the, my mother's side. My mother is Hallie. And so I go out there and the star, each star says, that's where I had gone before the world of DNA. But now after DNA, I've broken through some brick walls and I've got, I have found people. Sometimes I only found people maybe out there at, at the fourth generation level. But see, now I'm with DNA, I'm able to, to add people in the fifth, the sixth generation. And then sometimes it's even easier to connect with good paper trail data with those people. So it gives me a lot bigger, taller tree because now I have opportunities with some of these, I'll call them new ancestors because I did not have them before the world of, uh, of DNA. And one of them, his name is Eponidas. He's born way back when, he's six generations from me. So when I have a DNA match with people and I've got a lot of them that ancestry says, yes, this is your fifth cousin because they've posted a tree. They have good scores with you. This is where you match. So here I look at Eponidas and I look at, at his family and I look at all of his children, but I don't have any of those people on my tree. Well, now I can add them to my tree, all of those 14 children, and not only the children, their spouses, their children, these people had large families. And so it's likely we're going to add a lot of people to our database. I give you the caution in the bottom bullet for accuracy, you want to pause and be sure that the that these are really correct entries. But once you, you have established the fact, as in my case, that Eponidas was solid, once I know he's solid, then I can begin to add in his many descendants, not only the ones that go up my chain, but the ones who are coming down all of those others. Here I've, I've moved over to Ancestry to see what they know about Eponidas. He's a popular ancestor. There are 385 trees that go back to him. And of course, this is what I've found with my DNA. I found several of these people who were, were solid matches for me, and this was our connection. So now we can add all of these downward branches that go with our upward ones. Now, right now I have, I think I have more than that now, 600, I think I have more like about 800 who are upward ancestors, uh, but, but it's the downward ones that really fill up the size of your tree. And so with all of these new great, great aunts and cousins and all of those people, you can literally add thousands of new solid relatives to your database. And with those downward relatives, you can just go on and on. And so here we are using DNA to build our database because here in my case, I've got about 30,000 matches. I think that's no higher than the average because I know a lot of people have twice as many matches as I do. I don't have quite so many because my people who came from Germany, uh, I'm not getting all of those German connections because they're not selling the DNA kits in Germany. So, so I'm kind of missing out on half of my people. But when you post your tree, second bullet, 
ancestry is going to help you with their through lines feature. They're going to list out all of these connections. Here is, I've built a chart that says, here's all of my different people. So look at that upward arrow where it says, for that one guy who's about six generations up, I have 167 people that Ancestry has found for me that, it, that they have found showing that their tree matches my tree. These people have good solid scores. I can work with any of those 167 people and look at their tree and begin adding in all of those names of all of those people from their trees. So th this is the feature, I, I, we're looking at through lines. And so here I'm up to my fourth great grandfather. So there's Eponidas in the upper tier. And here's a guy with a really fancy name, Ilgen Fritz, he's in the lower tier. But they have found for me, here for Ilgen Fritz, they have found just above the star, it says, you may, we found that you may be related to 180 different DNA matches. So look at all of those people. And so they're, this is what they're doing. They're giving me matches for all those people. And uh, bottom line there, remember, you need to post your tree to make it happen. So here's just an example of looking at a bunch of those people. And so here, here they are, their scores are coming down the middle where it says fifth to eighth cousin. And these, these are fifth cousins. So here they're getting scores of 18, 13, 13, not very high scores, but you do not expect a very high score for a fifth cousin, but they're all descending from, from other, they're coming down a different route than what I come out, out with, but yet these people are my relatives, my kinfolk, and that means I can add an awful lot of data to my tree. See, we know, where's the, it's the star on the left. We know from their scores and their shared matches also that these people are solid cousins. And so we can enter their family tree data into our own database. And a lot of these people have posted very big trees. And so on the right, I've kind of suggested I think this is a really conservative number, but I think I could easily add with a modest effort, just say 10,000 people to my database as a result of that good DNA material. Now, as a caution, you verify the accuracy of the data that's posted because everybody doesn't post as carefully as we'd like them to. But, but because, because you know that that cousin match is a solid relative somewhere, chances are that you've got a good chance that, that the tree is reasonably accurate. And of course, usually you can double check that with other ancestry postings. <clears throat> Well, extending this bonanza number seven, we can lift the posted trees of a lot of our cousins and build on that data. We can concentrate on a specific family branch. I'll give you an example. I talked to you earlier about my great, great, no, my great grandfather, Nicholas Baker. He had a brother, Michael. They came to America together. My people settled in Illinois. Michael's people settled in Nebraska. On DNA, I find the Michael Baker people. And I find that some of those people have posted good trees. They are my third cousins because we connect one generation back of Michael and Nicholas. But they're good solid relatives, 
And here these people are, they have posted their trees. Here's a guy who put, he's got 5,000 people in his tree. And a lot of those people will also be matches for me. Some of them will be his other lines, of course. <clears throat> now, if I'm interested in, in doing more double checking with the Michael Baker people, like here are, here's some information from the Nebraska people. So you can see that I just put in the name. Um, these are marriage records, but here, here are a bunch of Bakers in, I have focused on Wayne County, Nebraska, and it turn, it's gonna turn out that every one of those people is a relative of mine. And I don't have them in my database at present, but I can very readily add all those people. If I look on find a grave, and once again, upper left, I put in Wayne County, Nebraska, they've given me 42 names there of different Baker family people, and their death records are there. And I might have found them on SSDI, but this was an easy way to find about 50 at once. So you can see, I can very easily add the Michael Baker family tree, which is going to be comparable to the Nicholas Baker tree. And because again, Michael and his people had large families, we're talking about a good sized tree that I could add. I think we're, we're coming into about our last bonanza, but I want to mention that there are early American opportunities for those of us who can go back to the early 16, 1700s. A lot of research has already been done on those people, and you can very likely you can find a bonanza. Certainly, if you have any Mayflower or Jamestown people, the Revolutionary War people, there's plenty of them. And there's a lot of, a lot of surname books that have been written for that time period. I know I have some for my early Connecticut people, and that's the Tracy family. And so I know that I could do an awful lot of good in a, with those early American records. But people who have the Mayflower, they, there's been so much research done on them. And so if you connect with, with a group like that, you've just really got a built-in bonanza. And this is more data on those early settlers because again, there are surname books, there are other kinds of books. That was for Massachusetts. The Virginia people get the same kind of a story. <clears throat> and if you move up to the DAR group, the, the DAR group has just all kinds of data on many of their people. So if you can connect with any of your people there. So here was, I'll call it the second half of our discussion today. We, uh, we talked about finding that data on the internet for the scribas. And then we talked about the different DNA opportunities and how the sky's the limit. And I suggested conservatively, you could add 10,000 names if you've got fifth cousins. And then from the early American days, you can probably add more. All right, we have come to just about the end. We've talked about eight different categories. I've talked about how, in my case, these bonanzas have added like about 45,000 names. And depending on my energy level, I could probably add a lot more. Because in many cases, the research has already been done. Even if you don't get the lucky breaks, you can still get and find a lot of relatives using existing data and think about those through line things that will also help you. And 
that's where we are. I'm going to push the button and and say uh, I'm going to have it so we can all talk. Thank you, James, very much for that presentation. You're very welcome. I uh, learned a lot from that, and uh, well, it, it makes me wish that I had a lot more uh, hours in the day to go uh, chasing some of those bonanzas that I know I have in my family. I have uh, German ancestors, and I've found uh, at least one Ortsippenbuch for uh, one of the villages that my ancestors come from in Hessen, and I've added quite a few names from it, uh, but there's uh, quite a few more that could be added from that. Uh, so that's something on my future to-do list. Well, we have uh, some time for uh, questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. Um, I will just uh, note that there's a few things in the chat uh, that were shared. Uh, uh, you can take a look at that, including some information about uh, another webinar series uh, offered by um, the, uh, let's see, uh, the Broward County, Florida Genealogical Society. Um, um, all right, are there any questions? We're waiting to see if anyone puts any questions in the chat. I'll just ask you, um, James, if you can um, share your uh, advice on when you're adding a lot of names um, from a book, uh, tips for doing that quickly while careful by while being careful to cite the source and to verify it before you add it. Um, but there's a lot of repetitive uh, work there. Um, do you type all of that or do you use shortcut keys or how, how do you speed up your work? Um, well, I, I was very fortunate with my German people because this, these were all new people. That is, they were, uh, uh, I knew where they came from. I knew what town they were in and and they were not, nobody had found any of them before. So these were all, you might call them virginal people that uh, they, they were just ready-made to just plug into a database. Now with early American people I, or with people where a lot of others have done a lot of research, uh, I think you do have to sometimes say, hey, did somebody slip in a name there that, uh, that shouldn't be there, but uh, but uh, you know generally you can uh, you can double check that with with a source. We, you know if you have a good source, uh, you say. Now, now let me say that with with the DNA things, once you have a good score with a person, you kind of know that yeah you're related to that person. It's just a matter of where are you related, and so. If he's posted kind of a pretty good family tree, and uh, if you can sort of verify that that there are some sources, you know, either through oh regular death records or something, uh, it, it should be good material. I have some questions meantime. Uh, let's see. Judith also asks, do those family books indicate the parish record? they take the info from. Um, I think that's referring to maybe those surname books or those town lineage books from, from Germany, for example. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, uh, the Sippen books, that, that, that kind of a book, they, they generally tell you right immediately that uh, they have drawn their information from, and they'll name them two or three different churches or a couple or three different villages and the records. How about other surname books for, say, the U.S. or British or, or other other locations? How were they in, in indicating well, the, the source? I, I think with the surname books, it's more of a mixed bag. There are some of them that are very well sourced, and there are some of them that some of their sources are questionable. 
And of course, where they get questionable is when you begin getting way back in time. Yeah, of course, if they don't uh, list any sources at all, then probably not one you want to spend much time of your time with other than to maybe get a clue that you can then go and search, try to verify the information, right? Let's see, um, Barry says, regarding repetitiveness of, of entering data, some common genealogical programs will provide assistive services, uh, uh, certainly towns which are indicated. Um, so like, I, I, I think what uh, Barry's referring to there is if you, when you start typing a town, like it, it can fill in the rest if you, um, type in the first few letters and they recognize the town that you've been frequently entering in. Uh, that sort of thing I've seen. Let's see. Um, and then Barry also adds in the comments, is this the name of the, uh, the British book? Uh, Chief English Families with the name Knapp, K-N-A-P-P. -P. A name author shared his father's 60 years research into 54 different Knapp lines. Uh, so I guess if you tie into the Knapp family, then then that would what could be of interest to you and in answer to Judith's question there. All right. Well, um, it's uh, a little past six thirty now, and so uh, we'll go ahead and, and wrap things up. I want to thank you, uh, James, for not just this webinar, but for the the numerous others that you've presented presented for the BYU Family History Library series. Um, uh, this will be James Baker's last webinar presentation for us. Uh, um, I, I suspect that uh, one reason for that is to have more time to add the names from these bonanzas that you found. Am I right? Yeah, that'll be fine. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. We really appreciate all your contributions um, and a lot of learning that we've uh, had uh, from you over uh, the last uh, uh, year or so that you've been uh, presenting for us. All right. Um, our a recording of this webinar, of course, will be made, made available uh, next week. Uh, you can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. Um, let's see, let me share my screen now so you can just see um, our contact information again. And then I want to let you know that our next uh, webinar is actually going to be on Thursday, January 6th with James Tanner on the topic, how does the family search catalog work? Um, please make note that we're changing the time of our webinars uh, um, starting in January uh, for the winter semester. They will be on Thursdays rather than Wednesdays, starting a little earlier at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard, Standard Time uh, rather than 5.30 p.m. So we'll hope you'll join us uh, for that on January 6th, and also uh, hope you'll have a wonderful Christmas and New Year's holiday. Um, as always, if you have any comments or questions, um, you can always email us at the email address on your screen, fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter uh, for announcements about upcoming webinars and posted recordings, uh, and you can comment in, on our Facebook page uh, and, and Twitter account um, as well. All right, thank you again, and, and have a wonderful Christmas and, and New Year. Good night.